Dzień za dniem, noc za nocą. Nasze życie upływa pod bezkresnym niebem. Marzymy o rzeczach wielkich, ale życzymy sobie rzeczy prostych. Myślami wybiegamy do przodu, ale jesteśmy świadomi, że życie toczy się tu i teraz. Spoglądamy w niebo z dobrego miejsca na ziemi. Potential investment in West Nusa Tenggara. Why? West Nusa Tenggara is ready to accept visitors and businesses? Fastest growing region in Indonesia. Consistently beats national economic growth in 2014 to 2017. GRDP growth of 25.3%, from Q1 2014 to Q1 2018 the highest among 34 provinces. HDI indexes growth of 8.9%, from 2010 to 2017, the highest among 34 provinces. Solid infrastructure. 98% of national road is in solid category. Zainuddin Abdul Majid Airport. Revitalization of Badaz and Bima ports. Gilimas, Lambar Port Development. Dams. Pandandur, Bintang Bano, Rebabaka Complex. Surplus of 25 megawatt. Additional 450 megawatt is in development. Strong government support. Online and centralized permanent tracking system. Clear KPIs for investment permit processing. Principal permit, 3 days. Investment permit, 6 days. Capable workforce. Young, Vibrant workforce. Workforce size 50% of total population. Low unemployment, 3.32%. Strong university networks. A total of 42 universities across the province. West Nusa Tenggara's diaspora network, national and international. West Nusa Tenggara scholars IP for all degrees, currently working with 26 universities in five countries around the globe. Welcome to West Nusa Tenggara in Indonesia. As a governor, I have to make sure that our province is friendly to business community, friendly to investment. So we are so happy that you are interested to come to our province. Thank you very much. Program zaprasza sponsor Miasto Toruń. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Sorry, I had some technical problems, but I'm now connected. I guess we may start. I didn't get any signal from the from those in charge, but I think we can start. We are all, already five minutes late. Uh, so hello again. My name is Lukasz Daniel. I represent hello. the Krakow University of Economics, the Department of Political Studies. And I will have this pleasure to chair to, uh, to chair this panel. Uh, to moderate this panel, uh, panel number 15, titled Political Strategies in Contemporary Asia. Uh, as we all know, we were supposed to be in Torun right now, 
but yeah, it's turned out to be impossible. So whether we like it or not, we are here on Zoom and we have to deal with that. Uh, according to the schedule, we have time until four, but yeah, that's an important announcement. I was asked by those in charge uh, to finish the panel by 3.45. Uh, because there is some kind of technical issue, technical problem. If you don't finish by 3.45, uh, they told me that the new group will not be able to start the new panel at four. So, okay, I had no question. I had no reason to question that. So I simply said, okay. So yeah, in fact, we've got time not until four, by, but until 3.45 which means that, yeah, it's even, even less than 90 minutes for the moment for, for the whole panel. And according to, the, according to the schedule, to the program of the Congress, uh, there should be five participants uh, in this panel. Uh, so maybe let's start with the list, the list of attendants. Uh, so let me welcome Ambassador Tomasz Łukaszuk, who is first on my list. Hello. Yes. It's Mr. Good. Ambassador, could you please turn on the camera just for a second? So yes. See you. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, number two on the list is me. So hello again. Uh, Lukasz Daniel is my name. Uh, then we have two participants, I guess, that from Slovakia, from the Slovak Republic. Uh, Miss or Mrs. Adriana Gogova. Uh, ah, yeah, you are together, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, they are together. They are using one computer, one camera. So, they are in one room together. Uh, so, Adriana Gogova and Martin Molchan. Sorry if I mispronounce your last name. We cannot hear you. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. Although it seems that you are unmuted, but I cannot hear you. I don't know why. For the moment, it's not maybe that important, but it will be important when you deliver your speeches. Uh, and I cannot hear you still. I could hear Mr. Ambassador, but I cannot hear uh, neither of you. So probably that's a technical issue on your side. I don't know. Try to figure it out and fix it, please. And last but not least, Mr. Wojt Witold, I'm sorry, Olejnik from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan. Hello, Mr. Olejnik. Hello, hello everyone. Hello, good, good day to you, sir. And hello As to far everyone. as I remember now, I remind myself, we were in the panel together last year as well, in total. I, yes, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, in some, yeah, in some I, better environment, definitely. I remember your Russian accent, so yeah, that was you, <laughs> I remember. Okay, so good to see you again. I didn't, re I didn't you, remember your, your last name, but now I can recognize you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and we have some visitors as well. So yeah, I, let me just welcome all of you together. So those who will not deliver the speeches, but will take part in this panel, maybe also participate in the discussion, if we have enough time left, of course, because that's the main problem for us. We've got only uh, one hour and 15 minutes left. So my proposal to all of you, because yeah, the, the first thing we should do is to deliver what we have prepared. Uh, so to give speeches, to deliver, well, the main thesis of our future papers, probably. Uh, so it will take us some time. My proposal is to limit the time to 15 minutes for each of us. Maximum 15 minutes. Yeah, because if not, we will not even deliver our speeches. So 15 minutes maximum, but try to be, if possible, try to be precise uh, as possible, as precise as possible. So maybe... We'll, there will be more time for discussion uh, left. Uh, yeah, because we should have some time to ask one another questions, to, to give our uh, opinions about each other's texts and uh, speeches. Yeah, but it all depends if we, if we are careful with time, if there is some time left for the discussion. Okay, so 15 minutes and yeah, I will, I'm forced to be ruthless here, so I will interrupt you. I will use the chat box if it's possible. I will use the chat box. Uh, I will use the chat box to remind you about the, the, the amount of time left. Okay, so five minutes ahead of uh, time and two minutes ahead of time, I will use the chat box to just to remind you 
uh, the amount of time uh, left. Okay, so not to waste more time, let's get down to business. Uh, yeah, and yeah, as in as in the schedule, as in the program, we will start with uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador Tomasz Łukaszuk. Uh, since uh, Mr. Ambassador looks to be the main star of this panel, let me uh, introduce him in a more precise way. So, Mr. Tomasz Łukaszuk is a Polish ambassador who served if the internet doesn't lie, who served as an ambassador of the Republic of Poland to Indonesia between 2005 and 2010, and also as an ambassador of the, Polish, of the Republic of Poland to India between 2014 and 17. And now he represents uh, the Faculty of Political Science and International Relations of the University of Warsaw. Hopefully this information is correct. And if so, Mr. Ambassador, uh, the floor is yours or the Zoom is yours. If you want to share your slides with us, I think it's possible yeah, to use the share screen button. I think it's an open yeah. option for all yeah. of us. So yeah, the, the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I will not uh, uh, take uh, time to, to, to present the slides. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, because as you, as you said, uh, we, are, we have very limited time. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for Mr. Marshawek and Ms. Marshawek for, for this opportunity to, to once again uh, join the Congress. Uh, I, part I participated two years ago. Uh, speaking about uh, modern diplomacies, uh, we, uh, as you mentioned, uh, so I, I served uh, in Asia and I was also the director for Asia Pacific Department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I, I dealt with uh, diplomacies of uh, all uh, countries uh, in Asia and the European Union as well. Uh, speaking about uh, modern diplomacies uh, in the 21st century, both India and Indonesia, as uh, many others, uh, they were forced uh, to uh, reform and change uh, the modus operandi modus operandi of, of the diplomacies. Uh, first of all, was end of the Cold War. It was a change uh, uh, of uh, the bilateral relations uh, with uh, many countries, including the United States, uh, including uh, China, uh, and uh, not speaking about uh, other emerging uh, powers, uh, not only in this uh, Asia Pacific region. Uh, both of them, they are very close uh, in the terms uh, of the cultural heritage uh, due to the fact that uh, India uh, put a really important impact uh, through Hinduism and Buddhism uh, on Indonesia in previous uh, centuries. And this uh, way uh, of uh, acting in diplomacy uh, is uh, very characteristic for, for both uh, countries. They use uh, extensively uh, soft power as an instrument of uh, modern diplomacy. The cultural uh, diplomacy is uh, very active. They are uh, involved in peacekeeping. They are involved in the United Nations uh, organization uh, as those uh, who are uh, not only peacekeepers, uh, but uh, peacemakers. And uh, the, uh, both, both countries, they uh, entered uh, the 21st century of not only soft powers, but uh, middle powers, middle powers uh, in the sense uh, of not uh, hard power, but in the sense uh, of uh, activities, uh, as I mentioned before, in the, within the United Nations. And uh, they uh, uh, also uh, efforts uh, to integrate uh, both Southeast Asia and uh, South uh, Asia uh, regions. They are leaders uh, of uh, the regional organizations. Uh, I mean, Indonesia in ASEAN and uh, India in SARC, not only due to the uh, population and uh, demography, and, but also due to the, uh, the active uh, diplomacy. Uh, they entered 21st century as middle powers, but in the second, uh, second decade of uh, uh, 21st century, 
they uh, became uh, already uh, emerging powers. Uh, according to the forecast, uh, forecast made uh, by not only political scientists, but also economists, those uh, two countries uh, will be within the five uh, strongest and biggest uh, political and economic powers uh, uh, by 2050. And uh, uh, for them, uh, the status of uh, middle power uh, is not enough. They would like uh, to uh, get stronger. They would, that's, that's why uh, both India and Indonesia, uh, they uh, change uh, the diplomacies. They didn't limit their diplomacies into the uh, regions uh, of Southeast Asia and South Asia and they went globally. They went globally, they became even more active in the, within the United Nations. They, uh, uh, they started to speak uh, more loudly uh, about the permanent seats uh, for both of them in the Security Council. The, both of them, they also united uh, within, uh, within uh, many uh, organizations and, and uh, caucuses uh, of uh, countries uh, which uh, have similar profile of uh, foreign policy with them. Uh, I mean, uh, for Indonesia, it was MICTA uh, and uh, uh, for, uh, for India, uh, for India, it is uh, certainly uh, quote, and uh, for in, in being an emerging global superpower, uh, those uh, two countries they are trying also uh, to be uh, uh, to be normative powers. I mean to spread the the models of the development uh, to uh, other countries uh, in on other continents uh, and. Uh, speaking about Indonesia as a role model for development, is uh, Indonesia as a country of the biggest Muslim population, it could serve as a, uh, as a model for uh, many, many uh, countries, also with the, with the Muslim population, as a uh, country uh, with uh, very well organized bureaucracy, very well organized diplomacy, and uh, with the profile uh, of uh, of foreign policy uh, focus uh, on global issues and uh, global governance as as it is uh, certainly with uh, uh, with the with all the uh, all the regulations uh, or the uh, peaceful um, uh, peaceful solution of the uh, conflicts and uh, other regulations uh, which uh, we can find in the United Nations uh, Charter. Uh, if speaking about, speaking about uh, India, certainly it's, uh, it's also the, uh, uh, the role, the role uh, India as a role model for all the, all the countries which used to be called the developing countries and the openness of India for uh, quick economic development for uh, the, the very modern model of development, especially in uh, IT sector. Uh, this uh, this uh, for those two countries is important uh, to have a new opening and new profile of uh, diplomacies and uh, foreign policies just to make uh, people around the world understand the new role uh, which, uh, uh, which those two countries are trying to create for themselves and their aspirations. Their aspirations uh, to be uh, active uh, members of international community uh, and to be also the, uh, one of the actors of international relations which uh, could uh, be alternative to the uh, model which uh, in, in China uh, is uh, promoting through its One Belt, Run, One Road initiative and uh, uh, with New Silk uh, Road as well. 
uh, because uh, certainly for both of them, the uh, Chinese uh, model is different. Bo both of them, I mean, India and Indonesia are, are democratic uh, countries and they, uh, they, uh, they, can, uh, they cannot uh, allow uh, China to take the lead, especially in uh, Asia Pacific or nowadays called Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, for them, the competition with China for this normative, uh, future normative model of development uh, for the countries in uh, Africa uh, is uh, also the important part of, uh, of the diplomacies. Uh, they are using, uh, they are using uh, in this context, uh, they experience uh, with Bandung process and uh, all the but certainly refresh and renewed, uh, renewed mode of Bandung process are uh, a non-allied movement. Certainly nowadays, uh, they are not trying to be non-aligned because both of, both of them, as I said, they are leaders of uh, regional organizations. So for uh, uh, wrapping up, I would say that uh, for, for India and Indonesia, it's uh, now uh, the time of uh, uh, transformation from middle powers to emerging powers. And they, they have to use all the assets of uh, the foreign policies and diplomacies uh, to, uh, to gain the momentum and certainly to uh, reach the status of uh, uh, the permanent uh, member of security council, but the question mark how they can do it to what extent the European Union countries and to what extent the United States, I mean, democratic, uh, democratic, uh, other democratic countries in the world uh, are uh, going uh, to help them in this very ambitious plans. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for the time. Discipline about 10 minutes, so you save some time for, for us and for the remaining part of the panel. I'm trying to do much. So thank you, uh, thank you once again. Uh, could we simply, Mr. Molcha, could we, could we check if your microphone is okay? Could you uh, unmute for a second because, yeah. Could you say something? Yes, I can hear you, but not loud enough, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, it sounds very, it sounds very, you sound very silent, I would say. I can hear a little bit, but yeah, we will not be able to, uh, to hear you, I guess, when you give your presentation, so maybe you should try to volume up a little bit or do something on your computer i, I guess it's on your side uh, so you still have some time to try to fix it because if not we will have some serious problem i guess i don't know if it's only me but i think i could uh, hear mr ambassador very loudly and i cannot hear uh, our slovak friends now so uh yeah maybe a little bit but not enough i think okay so try to try to fix it uh okay so thank you for the first speech modern diplomacy in asia and the pacific the case of india and indonesia that was the title of mr ambassador's uh, paper and mr ambassador's speech thank you very much i guess we'll get back to to that, uh, to that speech, to that paper later in the discussion. Uh, one more thing, uh, I forgot about it at the beginning. So uh, let me just, uh, yeah, to supplement the introduction, let me just remind you that this panel is part of the seventh International Asian Congress and the strategic sponsors of that Congress are the Marshal's Office of the kuyavsko pomorskie Voivodeship the Ministry of Science and Higher Education as part of the excellent science program and the city of Torun. The event is held under the patronage of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Poland, the Ministry of Science and Higher Education, and the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. The, the patrons of the Congress are also marshals.
Chief Marshal of the Kujawsko Pomorskie Voivodeship Piotr Ceubecki, Kujawsko Pomorskie Voivod Mikołaj Bogdanowicz, Mayor of the City of Torun Michał Zaleski, and Director of the Nicholas Copernicus University in Torun, Professor Andrzej Sokala. Okay, so that was something that I should have said uh, at the very beginning, so sorry for that. Uh, now it seems to be my turn. Uh, my paper is about, and my speech is about, uh, well, India, in a way. The, the title is The Change of Attitudes Towards the Commonwealth as an Element of Building India's Position in the Global Arena. Uh, okay, so I start the stopwatch. And I will share, I prepared a couple of slides so that you may look at slides, not at me. So do your own good, probably. So I will display them here now. The change of attitude to us, the Commonwealth as an element of building India's position in the global arena once again. Uh, well, it is divided, so my speech will be divided into uh, three parts. I will start with some basic information about the Commonwealth, then something about yeah, the bilateral relations between India and the Commonwealth, and I will finish with what is the key issue here. So this uh, India's position, building India's position in the global arena, how the Commonwealth can be useful to India uh, from this viewpoint, from this, uh, from this perspective. Okay, so yeah, just to yeah, remind you uh, of some most important facts about the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth, sorry, I will start with this one. The Commonwealth uh, was officially formed in, in 1931 together with the statehood of Westminster uh, and the recognition of, uh, of the sovereignty of the British dominions. Then officially in 1949, the London Declaration was signed and it marked the modern, uh, the birth of the modern Commonwealth and the adoption of its present uh, uh, name. Currently there are 54 members, 54 member states uh, of the Commonwealth. These countries uh, are located, well, in Europe, there are three European members, so mainly in Asia, mainly in Africa, in the Americans and the Caribbean and in the Pacific, so in fact in the whole, uh, in the whole world. Nearly all of them are former British colonies or dependencies of those uh, colonies. Um, yeah, the Commonwealth is home to 2.4 billion people, so almost a third of the world population. Uh, and includes uh, both advanced economies and developing economies, so both the richest and poorest countries in the world. So these member states are very diverse, uh, also because they are amongst larger and smaller countries. Uh, 32 of the member states are classified as small states, countries with a population size of 1.5 million uh, people or, uh, or, or less. Uh, sorry, now, yeah, now here. Uh, so yeah, in terms of uh, political uh, political systems, political re regimes, or constitutional issues, six, sixteen of the Commonwealth uh, member states are Commonwealth realms, which means that they remain in a personal union with the United Kingdom. So they treat the British monarch as their own. Uh, the British monarch, who is at the same time the head of the Commonwealth. Uh, five other states are separate monarchies with, the in, with, the, with their own individual monarchs uh, and the remaining 33 are uh, republics. Uh, uh, the shared values and principles uh, of the members of the Commonwealth are enshrined, inscribed in the Commonwealth Charter. Uh, they have been strengthened over the years in many other documents. Uh, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but they, yeah, the most important principles enshrined in these declarations refer to values such as democracy, human rights, uh, and good, uh, and good uh, governance. When it comes to the Asian part, when it comes to the Asian part of the Commonwealth, uh, currently it comprises eight countries and they are listed here. So yeah, starting with Bangladesh, Brunei, India, Malaysia, Maldives, Pakistan, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. Uh, yeah, but it, it sounds spectacular because 70% of the Commonwealth citizens live in South Asia, of course, mainly because of India. None of these uh, Asian countries is a Commonwealth realm. Two of them are monarchies with their own monarchs, and the remaining six are, uh, are republics. Uh, what is also worth mentioning that not all of the, sorry, I'm here. 
Uh, not all of the uh, Asian members are uh, fully eligible for membership in the Commonwealth, especially in terms of the level of democracy, the rule of law and the protection of human rights. According to the latest report uh, of the Freedom House, so Freedom in the Word, the, the, the report published this year, only India is classified there as a free country. Uh, well, six of them are classified as partly free and Brunei, which is an absolute monarchy, is classified as not free. In my speech, I would like to concentrate now and switch into India, which constitutes the main part of my topic. Uh, well, India, uh, so a little bit about uh, yeah, the bilateral relations between India and, and the Commonwealth. Uh, so yet as part of the British Empire, I India was taking part in, at the time they were called colonial and imperial conferences which were convened uh, since 1887. India didn't have the privilege of direct participation for a long time because India was not a self-governing part of the empire. And it was only at the uh, 1917 Imperial Conference that India was allowed rights of direct uh, participation. Uh, so yes, yeah, soon after, not soon after, but long before, sorry, the independence uh, in 1917, India was given direct participation and full rights as the member of the Commonwealth. So yeah, we may say the Commonwealth was the oldest organization that provided India uh, with, a, with a view of the world, the case before it achieved uh, independence. Uh, so yeah, on becoming independent in 14, in 19, sorry, 47, India decided to stay in the Commonwealth. Uh, well, the Prime Minister Jawaharlal uh, Nehru played a key role in, in the creation of the modern Commonwealth in 1949. And this decision to, to remain the member state of the, of the Commonwealth uh, became a, a, a justification for India's membership in the League of Nations. Uh, and it was, in fact, India's first major foreign policy decision after becoming, uh, after becoming independent. Uh, and in 1949, so two years after, India was accepted as a full member with full rights of membership in the Commonwealth. Uh, in the first years uh, of the Indian independence, uh, yeah, common, the Commonwealth was an important part of the Indian foreign policy. It constituted a significant dimension of, the, of this new republic's foreign uh, policy. Of course, there have been, well, ups and downs, there have been better and worse moments in bilateral relations, like in life, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. So yeah, there were some critical points uh, with regards to the Suez crisis, with regards to India's uh, conflict with Pakistan as well. Uh, and yeah, in the course of time, the Indian governments and the Indian prime ministers had little interest in Commonwealth matters. It has simply became one of many directions of foreign policy of India, of India's foreign policy. Uh, the India's prime ministers participated uh, in this uh, in this summit, in this biennial summits. They are called. Uh, Sorry, I will just take a check my time. Okay, seven minutes. So uh, the Indian prime ministers participated in most of this Commonwealth heads of government meetings. So this biennial summits, but uh, yeah, the Commonwealth was not treated uh, by India as its main partner in foreign, uh, in foreign policy. Uh, yeah, this image of a relic of empire. So Indian policymakers considered the Commonwealth as a relic of empire of the British Empire, relic of colonial times, devoid of any political or economic uh, importance. Uh, well, needless to say that between 2011 and 2018, uh, Indian prime ministers were absent uh, for, a for a variety of different reasons. They were absent in these summits, in these most important political summits held every two years. Uh, they always uh, found some kind of excuse and were replaced by their deputies or some members of government. But between 11 and 18, 2011 and 18, no uh, Indian prime minister participated in these uh, summits. It's also worth mentioning that India played some kind of important role uh, at that time because, yeah, between 2000 and Eight and 2016, uh, Kamala Sharma served as the Commonwealth Secretary General, which is in political terms uh, a very important post uh, when it, post when it comes to the 
the, when it Commonwealth. Uh, everything changed together with the Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, yeah, he became the Prime Minister yet in 2014, but everything changed two years ago because uh, Prime Minister Modi decided to participate after a, de a decade of absence. Uh, he, he decided to participate in the 25th summit, in the 25th Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting held in London uh, in April 2018. Yeah, and that was the first uh, Indian prime ministerial presence after nearly uh, a decade. Uh, there has been some kind of switch in the perception of the Commonwealth within the Modi's government. So this new political interest in the Commonwealth, as here on the slide. Uh, yeah, this was uh, being shaped through the lowering, sorry, of the rhetoric of the Commonwealth as an institution with a colonial legacy the rising of India's perspective leadership role within the Commonwealth. And we could have been observing that in the last years. So an absolute change of perception, also the rejuvenation of India's economic engagement with the Commonwealth. So the question becomes, what lies behind this uh, change of attitude? What lies behind this, this decision, be behind the change of India's approach to the Commonwealth and how India tries to use this international organization uh, to build its global position. So now, yeah, the last part of my speech, uh, I tried to figure out these different reasons uh, and I made a list of five different reasons that lie behind this change of India's approach to the Commonwealth. Uh, and here they are, I will try to, yeah, I will try to analyze and describe them very, very briefly. So the scope of the Commonwealth is number one. Well, the Commonwealth, as I said at the beginning, spans virtually the entire world, the entire globe. So for a rising power, as Mr. Ambassador said, India, and as we all know, India is a rising power. For a rising power with, yeah, with ambitions, with aspirations, with global aspirations, with growing economic interest, uh, so membership in the Commonwealth and the leadership of the Commonwealth could enhance its bilateral ties with individual uh, countries. This is especially important as India's foreign and security policy priorities include its close neighborhood, uh, also the Indian Ocean, but also the African and Indo-Pacific regions. So the scope of the Commonwealth as the first reason. The second reason, the growing importance of small states for India's foreign policy as I said, more than 30 uh, member states of the Commonwealth are the so-called small states. And in some of these states uh, spread across the globe, India has no diplomatic presence. Uh, the main diplomatic contact with vast majority of these small states is maintained via the United Nations in New York. So yeah, these small states tend to greatly value membership of the Commonwealth. And for India, they simply provide significant opportunities for its foreign and economic policies. Uh, also, on other multilateral fora, that might be helpful for India, one state, one vote. So the more allies we have, the better. And there are a lot of, as I said, uh, member states of the Commonwealth. So it's good to be uh, in good relations with them if we have some global aspirations as India, as India has. Number three, growing preference of South-South cooperation. So this cooperation among developing countries in the global South. Uh, also, yeah, from this point of view, many Commonwealth member states, many Commonwealth states prefer to deal with, with emerging economies, prefer to deal with emerging economies. Uh, so yeah, India, in the coming years is expected to, to overtake the UK as the fifth largest uh, economy in the world. Maybe it has already happened according to some sources. Uh, so yeah, as we know, India is one of the fastest growing economies uh, in the world. So for many developing countries, uh, yeah, they are now more interested in this South-South development cooperation rather than this traditional North-South uh, uh, model. Number four, uh, the Indian diaspora. Uh, so yeah, it's important for the Indian, for the current Indian government, uh, culturally, but also politically, uh, also in terms of its foreign policy. 
So the fact that there are diaspora of Indian communities in virtually every Commonwealth country may also be an important argument. And rivalry with China, well, there is a rivalry with China, not only in the region, but in global term as, terms as well. What is sure is that, that China will never become the member state of the Commonwealth. Uh, but what is also sure is the fact that China has risen dramatically as India's principal foreign and security challenge. There have been some bilateral tensions uh, in the last year as well between these two countries. Also the case of Pakistan uh, as China's rival is here important. So also, yeah, this uh, regional aspect here, also global aspect. But one more thing which is of utmost importance and significance for me is Brexit. Uh, well, it might sound uh, weird that yeah, the, the India's global position has anything to do with Brexit, but in fact it does. Because the United Kingdom after leaving the European Union is now very keen uh, to take on a new leadership role of the Commonwealth with India. Uh, and the assumption of this leadership role by India is supposed to improve the bilateral, uh, bilateral ties. Now the United Kingdom sees India as one of its leading economic partners uh, in the world after Brexit, which might sound paradoxically, yeah, but it is said that today yeah, the, the change of roles. So India has, imp has become more important to the UK than the UK is to India in, uh, in these circumstances. Okay, I'm, I've just run out of time, so uh, sorry for that. Only, yeah, only the conclusions left. So yeah, the last three, uh, the last three, uh, the, the three conclusions of the last slide. Natural potential of India. India is home to 60% of the Commonwealth population. One quarter of uh, uh, intra-Commonwealth trade involves India. So yeah, the natural potential of India to be the leader of the Commonwealth clear opportunities to enhance India's global role, uh, yeah, to maximize its bilateral relations within this multilateral framework of the Commonwealth. So Commonwealth, uh, and that's the last sentence, could simply serve as a means to an end, could be very useful. Uh, well, in the good meaning of that uh, term, could be very useful to India when it comes to its global uh, aspirations. Thank you very much for for listening to me, I will now stop. Sure, uh, 60 minutes. So sorry, I took one minute too many, but sorry for that. Okay, uh, so now uh, it's time for our friends from Slovakia. Hopefully, they managed to solve the issue with the sound. We cannot hear you. Adriana Gogova should deliver her speech now. I cannot hear you. Mr. Eleni, can you hear them? No, no, not at all. In the beginning, maybe a little bit, but now. A little bit, yeah, well, Before my speech, a little bit. Uh, so yeah. it's the same situation as here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now, nothing. 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 So. Uh, well, Zoom seems to work because you are uh, you are locked in, and we could see your unmute icon. Now we cannot see your unmute icon, so we should hear you. So there seems to be. I, I'm not. A, I don't specialize in computers, but in my opinion, there is a problem on your side, probably. with the with use but try to put the maximum sound yes. well, now I could hear you uh, but only only a little bit. And the microphone, uh, you know where the microphone is located? Uh, yes, I see. It should be next, probably next to the camera if it's a laptop, if it's a computer. But anyway, we could, we should, we should, we should hear you, I think. Headphones might help. 
or maybe help headphones yeah if you have headphones with a microphone as i do maybe that would be helpful because you would have sound just next to your mouth uh yeah but still it should work it's yeah, the distance is not that long okay so maybe with your permission maybe i will give floor to mr Vitold olenik so that we don't waste time and you will have some more time to try to fix it okay uh, not really okay so well do everything to fix it of course we understand that it might not be possible but hopefully it will because we would like to listen to your speeches and now I would ask Mr. Vito Tolenik from Adam Mickiewicz University of Poland to deliver a speech uh, titled Transport Potential of the Republic of Azerbaijan. The floor is yours, Mr. Tolenik. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? It's no problem. Yes, I believe so. Everything is working. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you in this, let's say, special environment, but we will try to do it anyway. Uh, my topic is the transport potential of the Republic of Azerbaijan, and of course, uh, probably everybody now is aware of the current situation in the region between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So, of course, like today, my speech will be more of a theoretical because we are still not sure how the situation will develop. I hope it will not develop in a full scale war, but of course, we will see. We will see. When it comes to transport potential of the Republic of Azerbaijan, this is the, how we can say, this is, it is not only viewed as a way to improve their economical relations uh, with, with the neighbors or with the global world, but it is the part of their foreign policy priorities, which we can briefly describe as a power of balance. Uh, they prefer, uh, they prefer uh, to uh, be more active on a global scale with the bilateral or maybe trilateral uh, uh, agreements than to join uh, a particular uh, sphere of interest, Russia-led, Western-led or others. And uh, that's why they decided to, let's say, make, make a use of their territory uh, in the realms of transport. And uh, we can say, and of course, when you look at, at the map, we can say that the Republic of Azerbaijan is a relatively small country um, situated in a very dynamic uh, neighborhood. But uh, if, we if we look closely, the geopolitical situation of this, of, of, of this country, um, we can say it's very far favorable for, 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 for this kind of transport projects they are now being part of. Mainly BTK, uh, Baku, Tbilisi cars. This is a newly built railway uh, joint uh, project of uh, Turkey, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan. In some way it is being viewed as a part of one belt, one road initiative, but we'll go to, uh, we, we will Go to it in a second. The second very important project is North-South Transport Corridor. Um, it's like a Russian-Indian project which connects uh, Iran, Azerbaijan, Russia, and as I said, India in some particular cases, maybe even Pakistan. But of course, we know the situation between India and Pakistan, even with with with, with Iran. Uh, and the third project is Traseka. A European one, uh, Azerbaijan has the permanent secretariat of Traseka project in Baku. Uh, also, they are, in theory, they are, they are very uh, uh, positive, their attitude is very positive towards the Traseka project. But of course, in the last years, we can say that this, 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 this project uh, lost its its momentum, we can say, but of course it's still there. It's still there, and 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 the Republic of Azerbaijan is viewing this project as one of the main issues. But of course we have BTK and we have one belt, one road. In um, as far as I remember, Azerbaijan is included in the okay, the second route of uh, of of one belt, one road project, uh, and. Uh, 
I believe that at this point is being treated as a priority in, 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 in Azerbaijan, but also I've seen, I must say, I've seen some reports uh, uh, from Baku, but also outside from Azerbaijan about North-South Transport Corridor that uh, it is, uh, for now it is simpler uh, to start the project of North-South Transport Corridor. That's why uh, maybe in the next following years, this project will be also um, treated as, as one of the priorities. Uh, but uh, as I said, of course, one belt, one road, we can say that now in Azerbaijan, if you open a company uh, which deals with logistics and transport, it is very good and it's a very good place to include some Silk Road or, or, some, or some other uh, name connected with this project. It will be viewed by the authorities, as you know, uh, 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 very positively. And uh, what, what we can say, Azerbaijan uh, started uh, uh, their transformation into this logistic uh, hub uh, from uh, rebuilding uh, from, from, from the airport. Peydar Aliyev International airport, airport was rebuilt with, uh, we can say it was rebuilt uh, with Belgian company Cargolux, which was, which is considered as one of the most successful companies uh, uh, when it comes to uh, cargo cargo airports. The second project is um, a Caspian port uh, near Baku. It, uh, last year it was transferred from, 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 from the center of Baku to the more uh, southern part of the city. It, it, it's outside the city, but, but, but we can also administratively, we can include it into, into the city. And their idea is to create the intermodal transport for uh, one belt, one road project, but also with this port, they uh, try to, uh, let's say, develop uh, inter-Caspian uh, logistics as well. And, uh, and yeah, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's very hard to talk to, to, to monitor, but, you know, I'm, 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 I'm trying. Uh, Okay, everybody can hear me. I'm here, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah okay. <laughs> you can I saw me. that my internet connection is unstable, but yeah, but it's okay. Of course, now, as we know, the situation is uh, complicated because of the war. In general, we can say that because of the Karabakh conflict, uh, the whole strategy of developing transport potential of Azerbaijan was changed because if we take a look at the map, of course, uh, all of those projects, they're already there. We can talk about the, the typical transportation project, but of course, uh, other are like pipelines, very important part of, of, of Azerbaijani logistics. It would be much easier for them to put all those projects through Armenia, not through Georgia. But of course, because of the, of the, of, of the situation, uh, projects are going the other way. And Georgia became one of the main partners now uh, of Azerbaijan when it comes when it, when it comes to their developing their transport potential. What else I can say? Uh, Azerbaijan also authorities in Baku they trying to portray Baku as the Dubai of the Caspian. Uh, in my opinion, they, they they have a really strong chance to succeed because you know Baku is the ancient, very beautiful city. Unlike Dubai, as anybody who was there probably knows what I'm talking about. Uh, and also, if we look at the map and if we look at the, um, how Azerbaijan, how Baku is situated between, uh, between Europe and between China, we can take, for example, a cargo Boeing 747 flying from Frankfurt to Shanghai. And of course, uh, this plane need to stop for refueling. Now, majority of those planes, they are stopping in Dubai. But uh, if uh, they choose uh, Baku instead of Dubai, they are able to save more than $50,000, uh, $15,000 in, 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 in gas, uh, in, in gasoline. Also, 
also I believe that for uh, for European for European markets it should be uh, Baku could serve uh, Baku or Azerbaijan could serve as a, alongside with Georgia and with intermodal transportation projects from Cluj Napoca uh, to uh, to Georgia, then through Baku and then through Azerbaijan through through Caspian Sea it could go further to. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, then maybe even China. Uh, this project, I believe, for European Union now is worth joining because if not, um, Chinese will monopolize this project. And uh, but of course, everything that I'm saying now is very theoretical because now we have a ceasefire between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But uh, at this point, it's really hard to, uh, to, 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 to predict the future. I hope so, I believe so, that this, these clashes, of course, much uh, harder than the last one. And for example, in 2016, they will, they will, uh, in, 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 in the following weeks, they will just stop. I hope so. But uh, still, we need to take into consideration, I believe, uh, also it is very important that in this conflict, in this particular uh, conflict now in 2020, um, we can see uh, that um, regional actors are playing the main role in this conflict, uh, not as uh, usual. This is, of course, one of the uh, many signs of uh, diminishing Western and mostly, in this particular case, uh, US power in the region. And uh, I believe in, 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 in the situation of today, it's really hard to predict how it will, how it will turn, especially with Turkey. But yes, at this point, as, as, I, as I said, because of the conflict, my speech is very theoretical. If anyone has questions, of course, I will be happy to answer. Yeah, in this IT environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's all. From Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Olaini, for your interesting speech. And now I cross my fingers for our Slovak friends and their sound. Yeah. Can oh, you now it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Great. It's, it's good afternoon. Too, it's even too loud, I would say. A yeah. little bit. We, the echo is very loud. So. <laughs> you, okay. You, you, you exaggerated a little bit, but it's better than remaining silent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, 30 minutes left, half an okay. hour left. So just for you. Uh, okay, you thank may, you. Yeah, you may, you may split this time into two speeches. Uh, well, I will not, uh, I will give you the floor in a second. The titles of, the, of your speeches, they seem to, they seem a bit mysterious to me, but there seems to be some kind of comparison between in, of different aspects between China and Slovakia. So okay. yeah, half an hour for you. Both. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Adriana Gogova. I am from the University of Serial and Method Use in Trnava in uh, Slovakia. Uh, uh, I would like to tell you that about the application of selected elements of governance in the Chinese People uh, Republic as a tool for more efficient governance of public administration in the Slovak. Uh, the aim of my paper is based on the theoretical background to apply selected elements of governance uh, of the People's Republic of China uh, to streamline to the management of public administration in Slovak Republic. Um, moment. Sorry. Uh, I give the presentation. Okay. Uh, the public administration management in the Slovak Republic uh, uh, in the history in 1450 to uh, 1998, uh, uh, centrally managed planet economy. The state, the owner of the almost all products, good and the sole owner of production and non production enterprises, the authoritarian political system prevailed. 
from 90s to the 20th century mixed economy, private enterprises, enterprises and organization belong to, to the state. There are three basic sectors, the public sector, the private sector and the third sector. The second half of the 20th century, extensive reforms that decentralization and modernization public sector. Uh, like you can see, uh, the characteristic of the public sector in the Slovak Republic is the recipient of budgetary resources, most monopoly position within the regions, high degree of inertia and bureaucratic management, the trend of securing operational tasks before systemic steps, organization focus on short-term goals, and the quality of employees is to lower than in the commercial sectors. The problem of public administration in the Slovak Republic that unfinished layout model, ongoing central management, number of bureaucratic process in place, insufficient control, lack of funds, method of management, neglected employee training, and low level of average of public administration. Uh, in compared the public administration management in the People Republic of China, uh, China is the oldest entity with a state continuity. Over the last hundred years, China has underground turbulent political development. From the 1st of October 1948, founding of the People's Republic of China. In 1978, China adopted the policy one country, two systems. In 90s of the 20th century and the first year of the first one century, implementation of reform, opening China to the world, integration into the international community, development of business activity of the socialist market economy. The People's Republic of China is a state with an authoritarian regime led by the Chinese Communist Party. In addition to the Communist Party of China, there are other democratic parties that have political freedom and constitutionally guaranteed equality before the law. Like you can see, uh, China's leading political institution, the Communist Party is still dominated in the China's political system. Uh, streamlining the management of the public administration in Slovak Republic by applying selective of elements the management in the People's Republic of China. The Slovak Republic is understood as a pseudo democracy. The connections, political culture, political honors, political morality do not exist. Critical views of political prevail, such as people with selfish motivation, love morals and lack of interest of in citizen. Unfair practice of politicians and corruption policy evoke nostalgia for the communist era. When undemocratic power did not burden the citizen with its disputes and the public was packed with final decision. The Communist Party of China is leading people on a path of socialism with the Chinese specifics. It is a kind of bureaucratic controlled economy that allows the existence of the state semi-private and private sector, combines elements of socialism, authoritarian governance with a market economy. If we compare the Slovak Republic versus the People's Republic of China, we can see that the management of the state in the People's Republic of China is in the hands of qualified people. The condition is education, expertise, experience. In the Slovak Republic, this condition refers to democracy. Every citizen has the right to govern the state throughout an electoral system. There is no requirement for expertise, education, and experience. Uh, uh, like you can see on the graph, uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, 2014, the Polish Slovakia agency conducted a survey on the sample of 1,052 uh, uh, respondents from the Slovak Republic, citizen accessing the competencies and knowledge of politicians. The results of this survey found that food here of the response do not consider politicians to be skyless. 
uh, in the People's Republic of China, the level of legislation punishing violation is stronger and therefore complexness is higher. There are 55 crimes for which the accused face the death penalty. Among them are crimes of an economic nature, such as fraud or embezzlement. In the Slovak Republic, fraud and embezzlement are time barred, and the, those that are pointed out are forgotten over time, or the excuse can serve for a few years and can continue to do so after serving. Governance in the People's Republic of the China is on duty basis. It is a state-run market economy for the strong purpose or economic growth throughout the country. Management in the Slovak Republic is still on voluntary basis. There are elements of voluntaries that negate of obligation of the state and which everyone approach after their so-called democratic approach. Thus, the state will not meet the goals it has set in its lens. If we selected elements of the management of the People's Republic of the China for streamlining the management of public administration in the Slovak Republic, for the first, political governments should be in the hands of educated people with experiences of qualifications in the subject. Expertise and qualifications need to be required, not just political, political affiliation. Otherwise, we are just wasting time and slowing down the country economic growth. In the second, in China, they are not ashamed of imitating other countries and taking from them functioning and proven elements of success and growth. The Slovak Republic should not learn from its own mistakes, but open itself to the world and take over and take successful management models, whether political or economic, for the purpose of economic growth and decreasing, it will begin of the population. In the third, third, in a rule of law and a democratic state, if it is right for the elements of governance based on duty and not voluntary, that the duty be enforced, follow to enforce, and it is not complied with or even violated to be punished. Otherwise, the law in such a state has no weight and it is a so-called unenforceability of the law. Therefore, I think if the selected elements of the management of the People's Republic of China were in, transferred at least part, partially to the management system of the Slovak Republic, it will be significantly streamlined. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gogova, for the speech. Uh... And last but not least, uh, Mr. Martin Molchan, Management of ter Territorial Self-Government in the Slovak Republic in comparison with Management of Territorial uh, Government in the People's Republic of China and possibilities of its efficiency in the uh, Slovak Republic. A very long title. So Mr. Molchan, the floor is yours. One minute, one minute please. One minute, please. Okay, take your time. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Martin Mochan. I study at the University of St. Cecilia uh, and the Metrobus in Ternava. On... Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, now it's better. If you could, uh, if you could, if you could move closer to the microphone, uh, we can hear you, but yeah. Okay. One minute, please. Okay. I'm so sorry. No, no problem. We we've got enough time, I think. The previous speech took us only ten minutes, not fifteen. So yeah, we have some. Okay, we have five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. Uh, yeah, more. <laughs> Because still is my my uh, yeah. presentation here. So you, you you need to stop sharing the screen. Yes. Yeah. And start once again with another uh, presentation with another file. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Teraz? 
Okay, now we can start. Yeah, we can see the presentation. So yes, Mr. Moulton, you can start. My paper is on topic management of territorial self-government in Slovak Republic in comparison with management of territorial self-government in the People's Republic of China and uh, possibilities of uh, its efficiency in the Slovak Republic. The aim of the paper is to focus on the comparison of local government management in the Slovak Republic and management in the People's Republic of China. And the selection of these aspects that would contribute to its streaming in Slovak Republic territorial government and its uh, government governance in the Slovak Republic, territorial self-government is uh, important component of public administration. Territorial self-government consists of municipalities in higher uh, territorial units. The municipality independently manages its own pro party in the, uh, its own funds. The basic role of the municipality and the performance of self-government is to take on the all-around development of its uh, territory into the needs of its uh, inhabitants. Uh, the higher territorial unit is in uh, it's independently uh, territorial self-governing and administrative unit. In 2020, there are 2,890 municipalities region, uh, registered in the Slovak Republic. Uh, Pre-registered uh, for the um, performance of effective management in the territorial self-government and um, appropriately assault uh, goals uh, with clear uh, definitive in detail case uh, Achieving the quality and efficiency of the performance of territorial self-government per, uh, presuppose uh, professional and higher quality management. Territorial government and governments in People's Republic of China at present the People's Republic of China has a flat year administrative system, provinces, autonomous uh, regions and uh, self-government uh, cities uh, directly uh, support dently to anger governments at present in addition to five autonomous regions the people's republic of china china has 80 autonomous re, uh, prefectures 120 autonomous dis district uh, or battalions uh, and more than 1300 local ethnic communities. Uh, the People's Republic of China is uh, is uh, unifer multi-ethnic country with 56 and, uh, ethnic groups. Autonomous authorities of uh, autonomous uh, communities enjoy and wide range of rights which go beyond the powers of the public authorities on the same level. They have the right to control, lock, uh, collect taxes and make an independent decisions about local and traction, uh, education, science, culture, 
shelter and at the local madras. Mm. Comparations of uh, the management of territorial self-government in Slovak Republic with management of territorial self-government in uh, People's Republic of China and possibility of its uh, efficiency see in the Slovak Republic. China. China has a population of more than 1.4 uh, point, uh, billion and consists of uh, 23 provinces, five autonomous uh, regions, four municipality and two special administrative regions. Uh, the management of local government and uh, China aims to merge, merge municipalities and uh, reduce the number of tel uh, the elements in order to prevent families who which is proven to be more efficient and cost effective. Slovak Republic and uh, present the territorial and administrative division of Slovakia consists of eight self-government regions for the point of uh, view of ensuring the task of local public administration, it would be quite uh, sufficient if uh, there were on, only three, two, four on the and such uh, division would be more eco economical and efficient. Uh, eight percent and present territorial uh, uh, and uh, administrative division of Slovakia consists of uh, eight self-government regions. Uh, reducing the man, uh, number of higher territorial units from eight uh, to three um, to four would ensure greater efficiency and economy, um, especially in uh, the, uh, the area of cost of public finances uh, spent on their uh, operation and uh, uh, functioning. In the People's Republic of China, the auto autonomous authorities of the autonomous communities uh, have the right to control, collect taxes and admire, mayor independent de decision on local construction, education, size and culture, health and, uh, and their local merits. In Slovak, uh, Slovak Republic, the tax system is centralized tax. Tax is uh, on a uh, natural and legal person. Persons are uh, collected centrally uh, in the state uh, budget. Uh, the territorial administration decides, uh, decides uh, and have only uh, selected real and taxes. Proposal uh, if uh, the tax co uh, collection model is uh, trying from People's Republic of China, the local government in Slovakia would uh, collect an administrator, corporate, uh, and personal taxes, which would ensure better and more uh, efficient tax. Uh, collection that is collection uh, closer to the citizen which is uh, the rule of the inter in time public administration it would ensure greater uh, respect for individual tax uh, payer and uh, eco eco uh, then uh, to the broad uh, responsible and honest tax uh, pay, uh, payers uh, uh, as and past. Thanks for paying attention. Bye.
Hello. Okay, thank you, Mr. Molson. Could you could you stop sharing your screen so that we can see one another here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So thank you. That was the last speech. We've got 10 minutes left. So yeah, not much, but more than I thought. So in case uh, there are some questions, uh, yeah, with regard to the speeches that were given, maybe first of all, or in the first term, I would like to ask those who decided to be with us here virtually, uh, because apart from the panelists, I can see also, let's call them guests of the panel. So if they were with us, uh, or if they are still with us, maybe first of all, I will give them the possibility of course if they wish if they want to ask the questions to the panelists uh yeah i can see my friend Piotr Głogowski. i can see mr mariusz rukat a, a mysterious k a m i don't know who is there or also mysterious lance ans and mr kamil gofron so yeah maybe one of the guests would like to ask about something Okay, I cannot see any volunteers. So yeah, so now I address the panelists. Uh, these, uh, I said questions, but maybe you've got some comments with regard to the, the, to the other speeches or you would like to add something or make a comment or ask a question. So yeah, we have nine minutes left, so feel free to, to do so. Hmm? Mr. Ambassador if, unmuted himself, if, so yes. Yes, I, if may I. <laughs> of course. Thank you. So uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for this interesting panel. Uh, for uh, Thank you for, for your presentation about Commonwealth because it's a very rare uh, really to discuss uh, this particular part of uh, Indian's uh, foreign policy. And uh, you show it that it, it uh, really could be an important instrument for India uh, mm -hmm. to achieve uh, its, uh, say, uh, global superpower ambitions. And uh, especially uh, concerns uh, small countries and they votes uh, within the United Nations. It's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, very important factor uh, for for uh, for India, uh, if, uh, for Central Asia infrastructure system. It's also very very uh, very nicely done, and I like it very much because, uh, as as you perfectly know, it's uh, interconnected, and uh, all those uh, infrastructure projects in Central Asia. Uh, they play a crucial role also for India uh, to, to increase the impact on uh, Afghanistan and uh, the neighborhood of Afghanistan as well. And to, to improve standings uh, as, a player, uh, as a player in solving hopefully soon uh, in a peaceful way uh, Afghan uh, conflict. Uh, so this and and uh, speaking about the, uh, the 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 comparative uh, politics uh, uh, study made by our Slovak friends, it was also the the I I, I like it very much and I, I never I never seen uh, uh, such a comparison. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, thank you for your nice comments. In fact, I wanted to ask you a question because you were there, you were an ambassador of Poland to India. Uh, as far as I know, you became the ambassador in 2014, so exactly the same year when Modi became the Indian prime minister. Have you noticed this uh, change in the Indian's foreign policy with regard to the Commonwealth? Uh, and in your opinion, can the Commonwealth be helpful to India? Uh, in its uh, global uh, ambitions, in its global aspirations. Yes, I mean, as you, as you, as you, uh, as you uh, 
uh, emphasize it's uh, certainly in Commonwealth UK, the United Kingdom is uh, the main uh, driving force and uh, and as also you were you uh, were what you said during your presentation very rightly that uh, actually now it's India is more important for UK than UK for India and uh, this will be also <laughs> probably it will help very much uh, uh, Indians to to get uh, to get it uh, the, the, the the Commonwealth and certainly yes I notice it because the the, the uh, it was uh, for uh, uh, for India. It was uh, very important uh, to uh, to travel uh, for to have a traveling prime minister, because Modi he visited more than 100 countries, and and uh, and the, the Manmohan Singh, his predecessor, he didn't travel so extensively. He was more focused as the economist and as a as one of the fathers of the 1991 reform, economic reform in India, he was he was uh, more focused on, on internal politics and uh, the economic issues. Uh, so Modi, uh, Modi as uh, as a uh, prime minister of Gujarat state, uh, because he was uh, he was the 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 the, the uh, he was the the chief of the government of the state of Gujarat before he became the prime minister of India. So he introduced this international uh, international model uh, of activities uh, for, for the, that particular state. And then he transformed it into, into the global policy of India and uh, the activities. And uh, mm, Nowadays, uh, common uh, commonwealth, uh, commonwealth, and especially in relations with the United Kingdom, uh, could uh, help India. But uh, but it's always bad. Uh, the, the the problem of uh, China, as you mentioned, also uh, this is the the, the because because uh, Chinese uh, uh, they uh, really. Uh, very keen not to allow India to uh, to reach the same uh, level in the international arena, and it's not about only uh, the, the permanent seat in Security Council. It's only about uh, small things like uh, nuclear supplies group, and uh, the China is also blocking access of uh, India to, to NSG. When the Chinese were, were uh, I remember when I was an uh, active diplomat, when we were knocking my doors to become. NSG member, so, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, well, three minutes left, so maybe one more question or one more comment. I would uh, be glad to give floor, yeah, the Polish are hospitable or are said to be hospitable. So maybe our Slovak guests uh, would like to add something or ask about something or make some additional comments. Feel free to do so. Oh, no, we haven't any question. No question? No. Oh, no question. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so if there are no questions left, let me yeah, simply thank you for your participation. I truly and deeply regret that we couldn't meet in Torun, but hopefully we will meet in Torun in the future, maybe even next year. So yeah, the situation is looks pretty serious, both in Poland and in Slovakia. So there was no other choice but to do it this way online. Uh, so let's just stay safe, take care of yourselves and hopefully see you live uh, in Torun or elsewhere. When life gets back to normal, maybe we will travel once again. We will participate in conferences, in concerts like this one, as it was before the pandemic. So thank you very much once again. On behalf of the, of the, of the organizers of this Congress, uh, stay safe, take care of you and uh, bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.